Good day, this is Job Aguas, and welcome to my lectures in philosophy. Today I will be discussing about teaching the philosophy of the human person. One of the new subjects or courses in senior high school is an introduction to the philosophy of the human person. And there are some teachers who may be new to this subject or in teaching philosophy in the senior high school. So I am presenting or discussing some of the approaches and methods that we can utilize in teaching uh, philosophy of the human person. Uh, this lecture is divided into three parts. In the first part, I will be talking about the approaches and methods. And then the second part will focus on the uh, capabilities of the students and the third part I will uh, talk about some pointers in teaching philosophy of the human person. This is now the second part of my lecture in approaches and methods in teaching philosophy of the human person. In the first lecture, in the first part of the lecture, I talk about the different approaches in teaching philosophy or in teaching in general. Now for this second part of the lecture, the second lecture, I will be discussing enhancing the students' capabilities and achieving active learning. So if in the first part of the lecture I focus on what the students or what the teacher rather can do, what approaches he can employ in his, in his class or in his teaching, now we are going to focus on what they consider to be the central part of the teaching or learning process. The center, the central figure in the learning process and teaching process, and that is the students. So first, let's talk about specific students' capabilities. The first one is self-managed learning. Self-managed learning. So when I say specific students' capabilities, these are their competencies that they can develop as students. So self-managed learning is the first capability. This is the ability to learn how to learn for oneself. And this requires students to discover the origin or meaning of concepts and principles or to work out problems rather than just telling them the solution. So we have to help them develop this ability to learn how to learn instead of just spoon feeding them and telling them all the answers, all the explanations, etc., etc. So we need to encourage students to think independently so that they will develop the skill or the competence needed to learn on their own. So that's very important, to learn on their own. The second capability is critical thinking. Now, this is the ability to make one's own judgments, one's interpretation, and not necessarily to not necessarily accept the perspective of others, especially of the teacher. Of course, the student must learn or listen to the teacher, but he must have his that this critical ability to make his own judgment, make his own interpretation, make his own assessment of the lesson uh, based on, of course, based on the discussion. So this is to encourage students to form their own positions that uh, there needs to be a time for discussion in those views. So we need to encourage them to come up with their own assessment or interpretations of a particular subject matter. So on the part of the teacher, we have to encourage our students to present their own viewpoints, to defend it against the challenges of others. There is classmates, for example, or even from you. So that he, he, he develops this idea that, or this confidence in presenting in defending his interpretation or his own view. So students therefore engage in critical 
must engage therefore in critical debate and discussion. And through these activities, discussions, debates, etc., this will nurture their critical thinking capability. The third is problem solving capability. Related to self managed learning and critical thinking, the first two capabilities is the problem-solving ability. This is the ability of the student to analyze problematic situations, to generate possible solutions, and then zero in, in on the most appropriate solution. The problem-solving ability involves two, two forms of thinking. The first one is the divergent thinking, where the mind of the student diverges along different path, meaning it diverges along different ideas. You may think of different solutions, possible solutions. And then the second is convergent thinking, where the mind of the student converges, zeroes in on the most appropriate solution among the different solutions that he had generated through divergent thinking. So we need to encourage students to do research to solve problems, to come up with different possible explanations to a particular, to a particular problem or particular subject matter. So we encourage them to think on their own. We encourage them to learn on their own. But at the same time, we have to encourage them to analyze uh, problematic situations come up with possible solutions, and then zero in on the most appropriate solution. So students, they need to develop a way of thinking about the types of sometimes ill-defined problems. And of course, in problem solving, we need communication skills because we have to communicate uh, the ideas that we generate, and we have to also to communicate the best solution that we have uh, uh, generated or, or produced or came up with. Now, the next capability is communication skills. Of course, everything needs to be expressed. Our ideas, our thoughts, our insights, our solutions, uh, even our assessments, they need to be communicated. They need to be expressed. So the communication skill abilities the, is the student's ability to express his own thoughts or ideas in a clear, coherent, consistent, and organized manner, either uh, by speaking or through writing. So this, this capability is very important because we cannot say, or the student can say, well, I have, I have thought of that idea. I've also thought of that solution. But if he cannot express that either orally or in writing, then nobody will know whether he really has the idea or you know or the solution. So we need to encourage students to recite and participate in class discussion. Uh, we need to require students to do research and not just to do research but to present the outputs of the research in the class present them either by oral presentation or by way of writing, so by way of probably a term paper or a report paper. So these are activities that will develop their communication skills. Now, the next capability is adaptability. Adaptability is the ability to maintain effectiveness even when working in varying environments and conditions or on changing new tasks. Because, of course, the situation in the class or the situation in a classroom, in a classroom setting, will not always be the same. There will be some new, new things may come up. Uh, they may be put in different environments. They may encounter, you know, different uh, challenges. And we need to encourage our students to adapt, to maintain, uh, to, to remain effective and efficient 
despite all these changes. So that's the the capability or the ability um, or the capability of adaptability. So the ability of the students to modify his responses to the changed circumstances or the environment will be enhanced more if we put them or allow them to uh, adjust, make their own adjustment uh, when uh, new environments or new situation or new new things uh, come up instead of just um, providing them the, with a solution or uh, spoon feeding them, etc., etc. Because if we, we don't allow them to work their own way through the different environments conditions and then, then they will not learn how to adapt to these varying environments and situations so we need to encourage the student to learn from their experience and to draw lessons from their experiences because through their experiences they will learn how to uh, you know navigate the the changing environment the new conditions uh, etc then the next is interpersonal skills. So this is the ability to relate well with others and blend well with different types or levels of people. Uh, and the interpersonal skills also includes the ability to promote camaraderie in teamwork within a group or class. So aside from the communication skills, the students must develop these interpersonal skills. Okay. Because they will not just be working with their own classmates, they will also be working with other people, different types of people, and uh, they, they need to develop this capability, a capability that they will carry even outside of the school. So we encourage students to join and participate uh, in their activities, in the class activities, and of course to work as a part of the team because that's where we develop teamwork and camaraderie. No amount of telling them that camaraderie and teamwork is like this or like that you know, unless we really involve them in working as a team. Now, the next part now is active learning. What is active learning? So one of the most uh, important aspects of the teaching and learning environments uh, that promotes the development of the student's capability is the adoption or provision of active learning experiences. Active learning experiences. So to develop these capabilities, meaning the, the previous capabilities, the student's capabilities that we have talk about just a while ago there must be an activity that requires their application and these capabilities are not usually practiced by just listening possibly to a lecture if we go back to our discussion on the approaches of teaching uh, we go by level from the direct up to the collaborative or participative because we allow our students to in, in, engage to be involved in active learning so we need to provide experiences for active learning okay. so uh, one of the most common form of learning activity that requires these capabilities is the focus groups discussion so that's one example where we can have active learning and this focus group discussion is particularly important for developing critical thinking, uh, problem solving abilities, and communication ability as well. Because here, you have to uh, share your own thoughts, analyze the insights, the ideas of other people, assess, uh, interpret the data, interpret the facts, and probably come up with solutions to you know uh, some some problems and the students must also be able to communicate to express their ideas 
So in this kind of activity, we encourage them to learn actively. Okay? So in this scenario, we provide them with experience to learn actively. Now, the teacher then must facilitate and stimulate this group activity and encourage students to participate. And this can be done by first assigning students specific topic for presentation, for example, and then assigning students who will be the moderator, who will be the reactor, and so on and so forth. So that's one way of providing a learning, uh, uh, active learning uh, experience. Now, the students, of course, are also required to do their research and make their own presentation as engaging as possible by sharing their own experience about the topic, by sharing their own insights, their own reflections, their own thoughts about the topic assigned to them. But at the same time, they, will, they also have to be mindful of the ideas or the insights of other people, their classmates, you know, who are also involved in the, in the activity. So again, on the part of the teacher, uh, he acts as the facilitator or the moderator. So he facilitates the in-depth exploration of the topic through searching and critical questions. Therefore, this, this, the teacher cannot just be really in the background passively, you know, observing what the students are doing while in the, in the middle of this uh, uh, activity. He or she must be involved. He must also be engaged as a facilitator. He must know what is going on. Otherwise, he cannot facilitate a more, a more profound uh, discussion about the topic. So, well, an optional activity could also be a group reporting in the big group or in the big class, aside from the focus group discussion. So, it depends on how the teacher will facilitate this bigger uh, group, group activity. So, again, thank you very much for listening and see you in the next part of this lecture.